Welcome back, AP. Uh, good to see you guys again. We've got two more flips coming down the pipes uh, just to finish all this Renaissance lead-up stuff, which is actually going to put us like a week ahead in content, which is huge. It's really, really helping us out. Uh, a couple quick reminders before we get into the Renaissance papacy. Uh, just that remember, we will have your first quiz. Some people have been asking this stuff. Everything is due the 10th, all right? That first full day of class, not the first day of class where you're only here for like seven minutes. I don't even have enough time to do anything in those seven minutes. If I wanted to check your flips, I even couldn't do it. So it's one of those things. But on September 10th is when everything's going to be due. And today is the 30th, which gives you, by my count, almost two weeks to finish up these last two flips, which is more than generous, all right? But I also have like a timer on this bad boy. I'm trying to keep these a little bit on the uh, shorter side. But you know what? Content's content. It is what it is, all right? But let's get into it. I really hope a lot of y'all have finished your books. I know Mia Nixon has, uh, like Sophie's World, uh, absolute mind blower. Um, but anyway, let's get into it. So we're now talking about the Renaissance papacy, right? Basically, when we talk about the Renaissance papacy, we're more than anything else talking about politics, right? So the political background and structure of Italy was very, very different from the rest of Europe at the time, which is the thing that set it apart and gave the ability to actually lurch forward and actually become the Renaissance states that you know of, all right? Your Florence, your Milan, your Venice, all right? Your Genoa a little bit, Pisa, kind of, even though, again, all they really built in Pisa was just monuments to human stupidity. But anyway, government during the Middle Ages, let's like harken back a little bit. We're jumping back into like the 500 to 1200 range. Government during the middle or during the Middle Ages was called was not called but it was feudalism and the church. That was it. And your day to day life, the person who had more control over you, would you think it was a noble or a king? It was actually a noble, all right. Nobles who own the fiefs, who own the land, who actually have the manor system and the manorial system up underneath them, they're the ones that controlled your day to day lives, all right. You were typically a serf that worked on one of those fiefs. You could have possibly been a vassal as a part of a protectorate, but if you were a vassal, you were still a part of a noble family. So somewhere along the line, you were a boss and a peasant around, right? So while these merchant guilds and these other guilds are growing, though, there are the slight gleamings of the beginnings of nation states underneath these kings. So kings are beginning to consolidate a lot of power, right? Now, a lot of this has to do with a number of different reasons. One of the big ones is nobles were not returning home following the Crusades, leaving up a lot of land that was just fair game that the state and the king would just take over on their own. Uh, the idea of professional armies actually expanding and employing these different, uh, employing different workers, former serfs, right? Uh, actually giving uh, the nobles a different occupation, allowing them to be officers in the military was another big way they were consolidating power. Uh, one of the biggest ones, though, has to do with just like rebellion as well as conflict underneath a lot of these different protectorates. However, we'll get into that when we get into the Reformation, which are about religious and holy wars, right? So anyway, but the church believed that it was the universal guiding government and force in all of Europe, all right? I.e. that papal supremacy idea, right? Now, mainly due to the fact of this thing called the donation of Constantine, which we will talk about later when we get into... Uh, the humanist side of Renaissance and kind of the a lot of the original thinkers when we talk about Lorenzo Valla. Uh, but the donation of Constantine, I have a star next to it, jot this down underneath it really quick, but the donation of Constantine was a document from the 500s, late 400s AD that basically said in a nutshell that Constantine, following his death, was giving control of the entire Western Empire of Rome, the remaining Western Empire of Rome, which included France, Spain, Italy, Holy Roman Empire, all of those things, over to the church. All right, so giving that control to the Pope. So basically a legal binding document stating that the church controlled Europe, i.e. your papal supremacy, that all kings would answer to that Pope. Keep that in mind, that document is very important. We'll get into that a little bit later. But that's a big way that the uh, church would actually exact control over a lot of these areas. Now, this is all the stuff that they controlled, particularly the Holy Roman Empire, parts of France and Par or France due to the fact that they were still devoutly Catholic. Well, everyone's still devoutly Catholic. So the Pope believed that he was the universal king of all things, right? But particularly Italy, Holy Roman Empire, where he exacted complete control, but he sought to have control in France, England, uh, Hungary, 
uh, not the Ottomans because they're Muslim, but a lot of these other different areas, which leads to a lot of feuding between nobles, kings, and the Pope themselves, leading to a lot of power struggles. And what happens when you have a power struggle? People lurch forward and begin to claim power during these vacuums, right? So looking at Italy really, really quick, I need you to write this down. Italy was fractured into three separate sectors, all right? Italy was not what you think of today, that promising country that does its best in the World Cup but didn't qualify this past uh, World Cup, but, you know, like has amazing food, and it almost feels like you need a passport to go into Italy because it's just so unique in and of itself. And when I mean you need a passport, some of you are like, do you need a passport going to Italy? I mean, like, even from the European Union, all right? Like, like Italy doesn't even feel European. Italy's just, it's just Italy. Uh, I've been to Rome and Florence. Uh, my wife and I are going to be going back in the next year to go to uh, Venice. We're very, very excited about it, possibly Milan. Um, but at the time, in the early 1400s, getting into the Renaissance, Italy was fractured and broken up into three separate pieces, okay? It wasn't a unified country. Most of these places weren't unified countries. Their borders were constantly swell and contract, and they weren't, like, set nation-states like they are today. So the three sections are, number one, and most importantly that we will talk about, is your northern Italian city-states, all right? So you have the northern Italian city-states. We're going to get into those in a minute, okay? But then, underneath them, you have your papal states, all right? So the papal states are the area controlled by the Pope, um, headquartered in Rome, right? Again, the papal states constantly fluctuates, swells, contracts, gets bigger, gets smaller, has, like, like the papal states have their own army, uh, as seen in one big conflict called the Gelfs and the Ghibellines, deciding who actually gets to control the papal states, uh, the support of the Holy Roman Empire, does the pope have control over them, etc., etc., etc. And the last one, some of you probably have already been cheating and, like, muting me, but it's not Sicily and Naples. It's called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, all right? Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. But that's this yellow region down here. It includes Naples, and it includes Sicily as well. So, but getting into it, wars... Be nice, I just said this already. Wars between nobles, examples of being the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, as well as church controversy, and including things called the conciliar movement, Great Schism, which again, we will get into later when we talk about the Reformation, when we talk about precursors to its instability. Because I don't really want to go into the Middle Ages, because I'll get lost there. If I go into the Middle Ages, I'll end up just like swimming in it for way too long. I did that last year, wasted like three weeks. It's not worth it. It's not even going to be on the test, okay? So, however, Gelfs and the Ghibellines, a hundred years war, all of this extreme controversy weakens the papal states, and it weakens the kingdom of the two Sicilies, all right? So what does that leave space for? Drum roll, please. It le that lack of power leaves room for Venice, Milan, and Florence, the northern Italian states, who were under control of the Holy Roman Empire at the time. Um, well, Florence and uh, Milan were. Venice was technically its own republic all the way up until the 1800s. But they were not under control directly from the papal states. They would actually have wars with the papal states and the pope pretty often. Um, the lack of power, though, leaves growth for these three big city-states. Now, when I say growth, I mean monetary growth more than anything else, right? So they actually begin to lurch forward, and they begin to establish these things called the northern Italian city-states, right? Now, what they start out at as are these things called communes, all right? Now, some of you are like, whoa, 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 back it up. If they're under the control of the Holy Roman Empire, or Venice being its own republic, uh, why aren't they not being controlled by someone outside, let's say, the Holy Roman Emperor, right? The thing about power structure and politics during the early Renaissance, late Middle Ages, is direct control is very difficult, all right? You've got no logistical way to communicate. You have rudimentary roads. It takes forever to carry a message. There's no telephone line. It's not, you can't directly control people due to the lack of technology more than anything else. And also the speed at which information travels is like frighteningly slow. All right, so what the Northern Italian states are gonna actually establish under the direction of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which later on will be broken up into tons and tons and tons of different informal principalities, is a thing called communes. What a commune was, was a sworn association of free men. Now, some of you are all like, oh, this sounds like communism. It actually is an early attempt at it, a very early attempt, before Karl Marx ever gave it a name, right? It wants freedom from nobles, i.e. your bourgeoisie, right? It's the idea of the proletariat controlling everything. Regulates, uh, they wanted to believe that the free men regulate trade, they collect taxes on their own, and they maintain the city walls as well as the governing bodies, right? So, anyway, 
they grew wealthy, but very politically unstable. All right. So what I mean by that, which is best demonstrated by this picture right here, um, is the the problem with a commune and the problem with communism. And the problem with some types of socialism even is that no matter what, you're going to have wealthy. No matter what, you're going to have powerful. The idea that everybody gets the same slice of the pie is very, very, very tough considering that everyone contributes to that pie in different amounts, right? So if hypothetically Lucas Ravano works 12 hours, why does, you know, like, what, uh, why does Denny Kelly, who works four hours, get the same amount, right? So this is a place called San Gimignano. It's a city in northern Italy, right? It's actually a former medieval city, and it was established early on as a commune as a part of the ruling body of Tuscany, all right? So this place is a good example of why communes don't work. See all of these towers right here? They're all built to different heights. Nobles, every time they would move into San Gimignano, or wealthy free men, wealthy merchants, every time they would move into San Gimignano, they would build a tower to try and show their wealth. And so every time a new family would move in, they would try to build a taller tower to try and show their wealth and their dominance over these other groups. This leads to political instability because people are trying to say that I make more money, I exact more control. I have this, I exact more control. I'm part of the wool guild in Florence, I exact more control, right? So what the problem is, is that it ended up getting split up into these things called the merchant elite and the popolo, right? So as the communes began to grow, it became less about free men working together, regulating trade, collecting taxes, and maintaining the walls. And now it's like, well, we're the merchant elites. We're the, we're the craft guild. We don't, we make so much money that we need to be, we are better educated. We need to make decisions for everyone. And popolo, literally meaning people in Italian, even had different groups in and of itself. The merchant elite was your nobles, basically. It was the new form of nobility in these Italian city-states. Made citizenship based on wealth, right? Popolo, which had various groups of common people, some were wealthy, called popolo grasso, which means the great people. They represent the common people in government. But then you had the popolo minuto, which are commoners that were disenfranchised, heavily taxed, like very, 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 very upset because they didn't even have the chance to vote or like participate in their republic government, which they're supposed to directly do which is going to lead to a lot of violent revolts. Some of you are like, what are you getting at, Mr. Terry? What are you getting at? Where are you going with this? Well, early on, part of the northern Italian city-states was a little traumatic. And ironically enough, it ends up leading into the same model that a lot of the Europeans use. Uh, republics would try, attempt to be established, which is the government where the, where, a government where the power rests in the hands of the people technically, after a lot of these violent re revolts, the popolo began to gain the right to participate in their government, to vote, and to actually directly try to influence their government. But what is going to end up happening in the long run is this thing is going to be called, like, merchant elites are going to hire mercenary armies to take down these popolo revolts, and the governments are actually going to develop away from republics into these things called signoris, all right? Now, a signori is one man's in charge, hands rule down to his son. It's basically a kingship, right? It's, uh, it's what every other European country had. It's kind of what every country ends up devolving into. We are holding on to a lot of our Republican ideologies with our representative bodies. But, of course, we do have a president. Uh, we don't, of course, it's not hereditary, thankfully. Um, and I mean that for any president. Uh, so, but a signori, it's where one man rules. They hand rule down to their sons. And enter the families. Now your family firms are going to be in, begin to integrate these uh, signori like strongholds. The Sforza in Milan, the Medici in Florence, that's the Medici crest that actually is going to be established in Florence. This is the Sforza one, which is dope if I do say so myself, because this one is the late Medici crest that actually includes the French crown after Catherine de' Medici. It's going to be married off much later on. You don't need to write that down. Um, but this is the Sforza crest, which actually has a dope black eagle and then dragons eating a guy on it. So the Sforza in Milan actually started by the great mercenary, uh, it's not Girolamo Sforza, it's, hold on, um, I can never remember this guy's first name, Sforza, Lombardi, the Medici in Florence, Frances, okay, um, so, Francesco the first. Francesco the first Forza, he actually was the guy that took the role of Duke of Milan, and he stripped it away from these people called the Viscontis. All right, so 
But he did that because they actually hired him to do a job, which was to try and take over parts of Florence. And then that went belly up. He actually just came in and took over the entire thing. But speaking of the Sforza in Milan, right? Milan, the way they made their money is mainly on their geography. Um, and we're actually going to stop right here. And I'm going to go ahead and shoot. Well, let me check. I might be able to just get this in in one flip. Screw it. Let's go. All right. If we just go now, we'll bang it out. We want it to have two. Okay. Go now. No second flip. Just two. So you'll end up with flip one, flip two that I'll check for the, uh, this is, like I said, it's putting this ahead several days. So you got Milan, right? Milan is in the, let's back it up real quick. Milan is all the way up here. Okay. In the northwest corner of the, like, Italian peninsula. All right. So, as you can see, it is within the Holy Roman Empire, however, it is technically its own republic, okay? So, going into Milan, though, their geography plays the best, the biggest money maker for them. They are a midway, midway point between the Holy Roman Empire and Rome, so they're a massive trade hub, okay? Also, they did a lot of manufacturing, particularly textiles. Uh, the only textile that was really being made at the time was wool, so you're talking about... Uh, Carter's guilds, uh, like loom workers, and textile creation in Milan was a big, big, very, very large business. They actually competed heavily with Florence over the textile rights. But then Florence ended up pivoting later on, and they discovered the stuff called alum, which actually dyed wool and stuff like that, dyed it a color of blue. But we're not going to get into that right now. So their government, though, was the Visconti is the one that started them under the rule um, before these Sforza actually showed up. And then the Sforza family, which was a mercenary ruler, right? So they're going to bring a lot of wealth and a lot of prominence to Milan. However, they never quite had the same artistic influence as the other two, okay? They're very politically tumultuous. They were conquered by different European factions for hundreds of years. At one point, they ended up getting completely conquered by the French. Um, and then also not to mention the fact that they're going to be um, then drove, uh, taken over by the Germans at one point in the late 1512 uh, or late 1500s. And as well as, like, like I said, the French. They are the probably out of the big three, the least impactful when it comes to artistic influence. And when you think of Renaissance cities, they're like they're on the bottom of the list. And then you move into your number two on the list, which is Venice. All right. So Venice, of course, being the trade empire that it was, um, completely controlled uh, Mediterranean sea trade. Their main comp uh, competition was Genoa. Um, but due to the fact that Venice actually developed a lot of new vessels and a lot of faster ships, they actually also entered into a trade agreement with the Ottomans to be their exclusive supplier to the Italian peninsula as well as to the rest of Europe. So they dominate trade of the Mediterranean, they, and they do this by, like I just said, manipulating the Byzantine and the Ottomans, and entering into trade agreements with them to where the Byzantine and the Ottomans, Ottomans would only move their items on Venetian ships, all right? So making Venice fabulously wealthy and a home to the Renaissance, and then not to mention the fact, making them also just ridiculously wealthy, and one of the reasons why they were able to hold on to their independence all the way up until 1810. Um, so, they're completely autonomous, though. They remained separate from the Holy Roman Empire all the way up until 1810, and my wife is texting me, hold on. Uh, she needs, okay, anyway, um, so, but this is a look at Venice, of course, the canal city, the beautiful place that it is, can't wait to go. Uh, I'm hoping it's not getting too touristy. So anyway, then you've got the cradle, the absolute home, place, just the ah of the Renaissance. Anybody know what it is? Very good job, Jules Bear. Florence, right? Florence, known as the cradle of the Renaissance, um, is the capital of Tuscany, home to so many of your prominent Renaissance artists, particularly your main man, Michelangelo Buonarroti, and... Also, is going to be heavily patroned by the Medici family, okay? Some of the most wealthy, and also some of the most wealthy guilds in Europe. Cosimo the Elder was actually the very first, uh, he technically wasn't a signori, but he actually worked from behind the scenes and completely manipulated the uh, Republican government that actually existed in Florence at the time. Uh, also was the first one to establish one of the first international banks in all of Europe, and was actually one of the economic centers of banking in the entire Italian peninsula. Cosimo also known as, like, was a large, he was a patron of the arts, big time patron of the arts, but nothing like his son Lorenzo. Lorenzo, also known as Il Magnifico, uh, was actually one of the biggest, or was the biggest patron of the arts, period. 
He allowed Renaissance artists to stay in his home, philosophers to stay in his home. He actually allowed Michelangelo to stay in his home while he was studying to become a better sculptor. He actually, while Michelangelo was there, he did a very, very cool relief called the Battle of the Centaurs, which is very, very poorly taken care of throughout history, and it's very hard to see. Um, but he also allowed even like Marsilio Ficino, who translated all the works of Plato, um, to stay in his home, who also had a direct impact on Michelangelo as well. Uh, you're talking about he also painted famous Renaissance artists, Cosimo and Lorenzo, as well as Piero Medi Medici, who came between them. Um, like people like Sandro Botticelli, the birth of Venus was patroned by this family. Tons. Uh, the um, Cosimo actually uh, patroned one of the very premier pieces of Renaissance artwork, the uh, Adoration of the Magi. Um, so, anyway, but getting into it though, huge, powerful banks in Florence, money to be sent, spent huge strides forward in art and intelligence, right? So just some of the pictures you'll see right here. This is the cityscape of Florence. I actually took this picture while I was there. Um, this, the coolest thing about Florence, even in modern day, is a Renaissance building is still the tallest building in the city. Uh, it's one of the coolest things you'll ever see. I actually took this picture from, with a telescopic lens from the uh, Michelangelo Square that's actually on the other side of the Arno. So anyway, but going forward, this is my wife and I in front of the, in front of the, Cathedral of Santa, or the Duomo del Santa Maria del Fiore, which is actually the Cathedral of Our Lady of Mary's, or Mary and Flowers, or Our Lady of Mercy and Flowers, um, or, uh, wait, yeah, St. Maria of Flowers, St. Mary of Flowers, and this is another picture of it as well. Of course, the two buildings themselves right here, the Baptistry and the Cathedral, are not the best examples of Renaissance work. The two best examples in this square are actually the dome, built by Brunelleschi. Some of you are reading that book right now. And then also the doors on the baptistry called the Gates of Paradise. It actually created by Lorenzo Ghiberti, one of Brunelleschi's chief competitors. All right, There's actually two sets of them uh, because the original set was so good they wanted uh, Ghiberti to actually recast and make another set for the opposite side as well. Uh, so anyway... This right here, this is in the Palazzo del Vecchio, this is at, or the Palazzo del Signori, which is actually, this is the ruling house of the Medici. The Signori of Florence would always live within these walls. The battlement was added so they could drop like rocks and molten, like hot liquids on top of invaders should they ever show up. And then inside of this right, or outside of this right here, was where the original David was supposed to stand. And actually did for several years, but then they actually ended up pulling it and putting it inside the Uffizi for preservation. And then, last but not least, you also have home to a lot of very, 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 very famous artworks inside of Florence that might not be as well known. This guy right here is Perseus holding the head of Medusa, and it's by Cellini. Very, very famous uh, bronze sculptor during the Renaissance that doesn't get as much credit as a lot of other ones. But it is my hands-down favorite sculpture within Florence that is non-marble, because you can't, you gotta give David credit, you know what I mean? But this guy is insane. So Perseus actually has a sword in his hand. He's holding the severed head of Medusa, and he's standing on top of her body. It's actually in the Palazzo del Vecchio. Uh, so if you're standing right here, this guy, the the Cellini sculpture, is right inside there, inside the sculpture garden. So Florence is the city you think of when you think of Renaissance art, right? And we'll get into a lot of different examples of Renaissance art and what makes it so good. Uh, but the main thing we're getting into next is we're going to be talking about humanism and the growth of thought in uh, the Renaissance era. But, guys, I believe that's pretty... Oh, wait. we got one more thing. Um, so, we got balance of power in Northern Europe, right? So, anyway, uh, you've got the balance of power in Northern Europe because we can't just talk strictly about Italy. Um, mainly, we have to discuss who is ruling over the largest factions in Northern Europe, particularly the largest faction at the time being the Holy Roman Empire. And your biggest family that is actually slowly forming these nation states in France, England, etc. Well, this family isn't forming them in France and England, but they're actually forming them in Austria and Spain, is uh, the Habsburgs, right? So the dominant power is still held by a lot of large families. Uh, you've got Francis II in Spain, or Francis I in Spain, who ends up taking over all of northern Italy at one point. You've got uh, Louis the... 12th, I believe. Is it Louis XII or Louis... The, isn't there no way it's Louis II. Uh, Louis XII. So, Louis XII that actually ends up taking over all... Like, tries to attempt to take over all of Northern Italy and then fails because he's actually dejected by Julius II. Louis XII. 
double check make sure I'm not saying that wrong. Uh, yep, the king of Naples. All right, so anyway, um, Louis the Twelfth ends up taking over these large areas, and he is actually a part of the. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, he's actually one of the earliest part of the Bourbon family. Now, dominant power, though, still held by large families. The Habsburgs, of course, having the ultimate reign, they reign supreme in the HRE using wealth and marriage to usurp most of Europe, okay? Now, what I mean by wealth is they would actually bribe the seven electors of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, funny enough, in the, a golden bull was actually decreed in the early 1200s by one of the popes that the way that we were, they would forever decide the Holy Roman Emperor was by a process of seven electors, right? So there were seven men that would vote in to decide who is going to be the next Holy Roman Emperor every time an emperor was left without an heir, right? So funny enough, though, the Habsburgs were able to dominate this entire process by bribing only four of them, because that's all you really needed. And the Habsburgs are also going to use their marriage abilities to actually usurp a lot of power and gain a lot of territorial land. The way they're going to do this, the way they're going to actually control and usurp a lot of land in all of Europe is basically through marriage, right? This is the magic of marriage and how Habsburgs went to control Spain, parts of France, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and even Austria, right? And also I'm going to show you a funny picture about how they got all jacked up because it got so inbred. But anyway, now, Maximilian I is actually one of the chief Habsburgs and he is the first Habsburg to become Holy Roman Emperor. What he's going to do is he's going to turn around he's going to marry Mary of Burgundy, right? They are going to give birth, Mary of Burgundy being a ruler in France, right? So he ends up claiming some area in northern France. They are going to give birth to Philip, right? Philip I. Now, Philip I is going to turn around to try and usurp lands within Spain. He is going to marry the last surviving daughter of the Spanish crown underneath Ferdinand and Isabella. Her name was Joanna the Mad, right? They called her Joanna the Mad because they say that she ended up going mentally insane, but they're still going to have several children. Their biggest and baddest child out of all of them was this guy, Charles V, who upon his birth and his coronation as Holy Roman Empire, now if you paid attention well enough, controls areas within France. He now controls the Netherlands. He controls the Holy Roman Empire. He controls Spain. And he controls parts of Austria that were still a part of the Holy Roman Empire at the time. You're talking about five current day established countries all under the control of one guy. No wonder he freaked out and ended up retiring to a monastery later in life, right? However, under Charles V, it's going to turn into a very, 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 very bad situation following his reign, okay? What I mean by that it's going to turn into a bad situation because a lot of his relative, relatives start marrying and having children with their relatives, right? Some as bad as niece to uncle, all right? So some as bad as first cousins. But they're doing this to try and keep those land holdings within the family. Now, as an image of the dying, and this is what their family tree ended up looking like, right? So you got Philip the First, Joanna the Mad, and then they have all these kids. Every time you see a double crossover, that means that these people had these children together. But as you can see, these people, these two, the Castiles and the Aragons from Spain, began to interbreed with each other to keep control over Spain. And the worst of the worst of them was this guy down here at the bottom. His name is Carlos II, all right? Charles II to anyone who's not from Spain. His genetic deformities from years and years and years of inbreeding in the Habsburg family was so bad that he had the protruded, what was called Habsburg jaw, all right? The Habsburg jaw causing a huge underbite and actually, like, and you can see it in some of these other, now that you're looking at it, you can see it in Charles, right? You see how he's got that huge underbite? Habsburg jaw was a genetic deformity that this family would end up developing. Carlos's was so bad that he constantly drooled. He could barely talk, and he actually didn't even start speaking until he was about eight years old, all right? He actually didn't start walking until he was four. Um, he ended up uh, being, I believe he was sterile. I don't think he had any other kids, which led to the fall of the Habsburg monarchy within Spain. Now, not to mention the fact, too, funny enough, that he was actually only really good at one thing. He was only apparently a very good marksman. So he couldn't shoot anything, but he would just, I mean, like, he couldn't talk very well, but he'd just be like, pull. I mean, or he'd be like, uh, he could barely talk. Like, so due to the fact that his family linter, literally interbred to keep power, right? So as you can tell, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Um, this flip is long. And like I said, this way you only have to do one. Uh, so 
but that's it. And we're going to let you go. And I guess I'll see you guys on, I think it's like the 6th, it's 7th. It's one of those days. All right. So, but I'll see you guys then. I hope you all have an enjoyable rest of your break. You got about a week ish left. Sorry. Uh, it's just kind of one of those things. You got to get back to work. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Looking forward to a great new year. And I'll see you guys then. Have a good one, AP.